This series of videos introduces the 38 chapters of the Routledge Handbook of Environmental Movements. It's a project of the Social Change Lab, and we gratefully acknowledge the support of the Mary Lee bequest for the work of our team. Hi, everyone. I'm Winifred Lewis, and I'm a professor in psychology at the University of Queensland. And I am uh, Joanna Huckster. I am a professor of environmental studies at Eckerd College in St. Petersburg, Florida. Hey guys, I'm Austin Manchotti and I'm a research assistant on the project. I'm Joyce, I'm a student at the University of Queensland. And what we're doing is this video is um, we're making a series where we do introductions for all 38 chapters of the Routledge Handbook of Environmental Movements. And at this point, we have made our way to chapter 31 and the title of the chapter, flipping madly, is Influence of Environmental Movements on Public Opinion and, and Attitudes. Do People's Movements Move the People? And in fact, Professor Huckster, who's right here, wrote the chapter. So we can ask her, do people's movements move the people? Well, the answer to that question is it's complicated. Um, it, define, it depends how you define the people. Um, and it also uh, depends on um, where in the country or in the world or um, what segment of the population we're talking about. And the other part of the answer is that we don't actually know empirically, we don't have data, we haven't measured very frequently if the environmental movement has an influence on public opinion. And it's actually quite difficult to measure. So most of what we know is either um, through observation or um, through thinking about the different ways that public opinion can be changed and, and making hypotheses. But we aren't actually sure decidedly if the environmental movement um, has changed public opinion and exactly how much. Can I just jump in and ask you to define public opinion? What is public opinion? Sure. So public opinion is... Um, what it is that a segment of the population um, or the entire population, depending where you are, um, thinks about something. And public opinion can be used to think about risk perceptions, for example. Um, so when it comes to environmental issues, we often talk about people's concern for the issue or how, how risky they think the environmental issue is. So for climate change, for example, we're often talking about um, climate change concern. Um, and that is a measure of public opinion. But there are lots of different ways we can measure public opinion. And when we talk about public opinion and the environment, um, we think about lots of different ways we can measure that. So one thing we could look at, for example, is what percentage of um, a population considers themselves environmentalists or what segment of the population is part of an environmental group. Um, but we could also look at attitudes like what, what percentage of the population says they are concerned about water quality or air pollution or the state of the environment. And all of those are different ways to measure public opinion. And something that's also really important is to understand that there's a difference between um, attitudes and opinion and concern and behavior. Just because someone says that they are concerned about the environment or have a positive attitude towards helping the environment doesn't mean that they will actually do the behaviors that are necessary um, to, to solve environmental issues. Okay, um, so Professor Hasker, I just wanna ask what's the role of media here in terms of environmental movements? That's a great question. Um, so what we know is that um, media has a significant influence on public opinion. We don't have a lot of data on how the media has influenced public opinion on the environment specifically, but we do know that the media has the ability to change public opinion pretty drastically on a number of different issues. And uh, one of the places in which this is most studied is the United States. And in the United States, particularly as media has become very politically polarized, we see um, very clear um, changes in public opinion that match the polarization of media on a bunch of different issues. So we can track how much the media covers an issue and then how much um, the public's opinion has changed on that issue and see that they move together a fair amount. Um, but uh, we only have some studies that actually look at how environmental issues are covered in the media and how much that is reflected in public opinion. 
Um, so one can assume that if the environmental movement is getting headlines, is making its way into the media, that that is one avenue through which they might influence public opinion. So we can't, or it's very difficult to look at the environmental movement and say, okay, here's a measurement of how much action there's been in the environmental movement. How do we measure that? And then here's a measurement of public opinion and compare them. But what we can do is say, here's how many times climate change um, was mentioned by environmental movements or environmental organizations. Here's how many times climate change was mentioned by the media over this same period of time. And here's public concern over that same period of time. And we can look at how they might be related to one another. And when we do that, we usually find that the environmental movement is influencing the media and then the media is influencing the public rather than the environmental movement directly influencing the public. That's a great question, Joyce. Thank you. Professor, Thank you for I'd also, that. Oops, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Professor, I'd also like to know what about leaders? Do they make a difference to these sorts of things? Absolutely. Um, so one of the other things that is often found is that um, the leaders in a lot of different areas, political leaders, which we sometimes call political elites, but other types of elites like cultural elites, um, uh, I'm sorry, pop culture figures, for example, can have a strong influence on public opinion. Uh, there's a really common misconception that um, in democratic countries, um, you know, after a leader is elected, that the leader, the political leader, then um, follows the desires and the opinions and the concerns of the public. And what we actually find when we study that is that public concerns and opinions tend to follow those of the political elites, of the political leaders. So if political leaders make public statements on the media, or if they vote in a certain way on a certain bill, that their political followers tend to actually change their opinions to match the leader rather than the other way around. And so one thing that we can take from this is that if um, the environmental movements are able to influence political leaders, um, the political leaders will then be able to influence the public. This isn't really the way that environmental movements tend to conceptualize their work, although that has been changing in recent years. Usually environmental movements say, okay, we'll change the public and then the public will demand that the leaders do something. But when we look at the research and break it down, it looks more like they would be more effective targeting the political leaders and that that would actually change public opinion. And I guess like that ties into the next point, which is that when you look at um, change and, and behaviors and attitudes, some things are a lot easier than others, right? Like, I'd be curious to hear if you've got a 30 second answer, how you do change leaders. <laughs> and then maybe you can talk about what other behaviors movements have been able to change um, more readily than, than the others they can't. Mm -hmm. That becomes more difficult. Um, so, <sighs> In many of the um, most developed countries and capitalist countries in the world, like the United States, which is where I currently am, um, much of our democratic process has sort of um, evolved over towards being influenced a lot by business, by industry, um, and by the money from those industries. And those um, that influence has really made it difficult to get leaders, political leaders, to do things that go against the industries that support them. So that has really upped the ante for environmental organizations. Environmental organizations um, in the 1970s, when this, these the rules associated with how much industry could get involved were a little different, were able to get a lot more accomplished than they have been in recent decades. Um, and uh, I think that the groups that are most effective right now at getting some change from their political leadership are those that are able to convince the political leadership that some portion of their public will not vote for them or will not continue to support them if they don't make the changes necessary. The, it, the thing there is you don't have to actually get 100% of, you know, let's make up a political leader, let's call him Robin, because I'm looking at a stuffed Robin right now. <laughs> if getting Robin um, to, uh, to change his opinion on, you know, water pollution, you only need to convince him, the environmental movement, environmental organization only needs to convince him that, you know, 60% of his constituency won't vote for him. Um, even if that's not necessarily true, if he doesn't change his attitude on, um, 
on water pollution. And that should be enough to change political leaders' attitudes in a lot of cases. Um, so it's sort of like this complicated workaround, right? The public doesn't really change their opinion unless the political leaders change their opinion. But in order to change the political leader's opinion, you have to convince them that they might not get, it, get to stay in office if they don't do the thing that you want them to do. And I guess like in a way, you only really need to change 5% of people at the middle there. So yes. you don't actually need the 60% because there's probably no. already 49% that are ready to move for the other guy. You only need those middle guys. And if you can change them, you change the leader. But coming exactly. back to what, and that's what, yeah. the, that's what the smart the smart movements and the smart organizations are doing is working on those people in the middle. We see a lot in the U.S. right now, there's so much political polarization. We see a lot of people fighting on the fringes, but the smart organizations are working on those people right at the middle because you only need to change that margin to flip things over. Yeah. And just before we wrap up this part one, because we are going to go to part two, um, I wonder if you could comment on some of the things that movements do find easy. So you're really talking at one point in the chapter about the world of social media and you know petitions mm -hmm. and donations and how in a way mm -hmm. that's quite different from other behaviors that movements target can you talk about that please yeah absolutely so um in this current internet world um and in the world of social media what we've seen is is uh, a rise of something called clicktivism and clicktivism is a form of activism that takes basically as little effort as possible you click a button um, so for example social media petitions um, where they say you know sign here to tell you know senator so and so or congressman so and so or prime minister so and so to do this thing that's super easy people will do it um, it takes very little effort. It doesn't really move them up the activism chain, though. So even if you get them to sign that one thing the one time, you haven't really brought them into the movement. So it's easy to get people to do that. It's not that hard to get somebody to donate five dollars, especially if they're, you know, tired of seeing, um, you know, pictures of sad dogs on their screen. And they're just like, hey, if I send you five dollars, will you please leave me alone? And um, that's not what happens. They keep bothering you. But um, but um, those types of things are actually pretty easy. Getting people to do um, move up the the chain of activism to do things like um, write a letter to somebody um, to a political leader to call a political leader, especially young people now are like, please don't make me get on the telephone. I will text them, but don't make me call them. Um, tell me that's not true. Um, and getting them to do those types of actions, show up at a protest. Um, go and do uh, campaigning to, to get other people on board, that's much, much harder to get people to do um, than getting them to click the petition. We love those pre-written emails that you can just write your name on and send. Um, so there are things that are easier to get people on board with than others. Yeah, and that's where the psychology of it really comes in. Like we know from our work in psych that you've got to change someone's identity to get them to take on the norms, to get them to take on the more difficult behavior. So that's yes. going to be a really fun. I mean, you close the chapter by saying um, there needs to be a lot more empirical work. I think that's just a reality. Is there anything else you want to say at this point in part one um, that we're wrapping up, a key takeaway from the entire yeah. chapter? I mean, I think this isn't a, a helpful takeaway for public opinion so much as this idea that we need more empirical work is it's so crucial, but also we need more empirical work that doesn't just focus on um, majority um, and um, highly developed majority people and highly developed nations. Mm -hmm. um, there's very little work um, outside of, you know, Europe, the United States, Australia, um, looking at public opinion on these things. Um, there's very little work within those countries looking at the opinions of marginalized communities. And so when we talk about public opinion, we're usually just talking about one very specific segment, an affluent, generally white uh, population. And that's not, there's so much more variety and diversity in culture and public opinion really changes when you look at those different cultures. Oh, thank you, Professor Huckster. And I know that um, Joyce and Austin and I all feel a sense of um, excitement about hearing you explain the chapter so compellingly in this 10-minute uh, time. So let's finish with part one there and say thank you again. You're very welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Good. For those of you watching, be sure to subscribe and follow us at Social Change UQ. And check out our website for more videos.